Good afternoon. My name is uh, Professor David Golomb, and I welcome you to the annual Zlotowski Lecture. I am the chair of the Zlotowski Center for Neuroscience. We have a fantastic program planned for this afternoon. We will begin after the presentation of the Zlotowski Admission Awards for outstanding students, followed by thought-provoking a, a lecture by the Nobel Prize laureate Edward Moser. I would like to begin by addressing the recipient of this year's Lotowski Admission Award for Outstanding Students. This award is given only to the very best new students at BGU based on an average of their matriculation exam and scores and their psychometric exam scores. This year, the award was granted to a total of 175 students. Zlotowski students consistently prove that their award is well deserved. They have maintained higher grades at the departmental and faculty level and often receive additional prizes for outst outstanding achievements. The percentage of Zlotowski students who pursue graduate degrees at BGU is significantly higher than that of other students. It is my pleasure to ask the student representing this year's Zlotowski Admission Awards recipients to stand up and be recognized. We have two recipients today who will speak on behalf of the larger recipient group, Adi Gottlieber, Department of Cognitive Sciences and uh, Psychology, and Michal Katz, Department of Politics and Government and Communication Studies. I would now like to ask Adi Gottlieber and Michal Katz to represent our Zlotowski Award recipients to join me on stage and say a few words. Shalom. My name is Adi Gottlieber. I'm from Ramat Gan. I'm a first year student at the Department of Cognitive Science and Psychology. My name is Michal Katz. I'm from Beersheba. I'm a first year student at the Departments of Politics and Government and Communication Studies. As a teenager, I was active in the Israel Scouts as a guide and as a Scoutsmaster. My years in the Scouts had a big impact on my personality and my values. They reinforced my connection to Israel and to our society and history, and also strengthened my sense of responsibility, creativity, and concern of others. In high school, I studied theater, and I was a member of a modern jazz troupe. In high school, I volunteered in AMPA, an organization that provides support to Holocaust survivors. Spending time with them gave me a glimpse into the extent of human kindness and resilience. It also made me want to create a better world than the one they had experienced. I served in the Israel Air Force as a flight simulator instructor of F-15 combat pilots. I volunteered to serve for three years instead of two years as part of the Women Just As Men Command, requiring that women soldiers serve the same amount of time as men in the IDF. I was happy to do so because I believe in equality between men and women in all aspects, both in duties and in rights. I completed the Army Officer course and became an F-15 Simulator Training Officer. I study political science because I want to make a change. I study communications as my second major because media constantly shapes the way we see the world. And I'd like to make people see the world with more compassion and humanity. As part of my communication studies, I take part in an internship program at the local radio station, Radio Durham, which I really enjoy. I've learned a lot about the behind the scenes of a radio station. I'm also part of the LGBTI Students Association of BGU and the Pride House, two organizations that support the Beersheba LGBTQ community, promoting awareness and providing a safe space to be who you are without having to hide. Although I found my own family and friends largely accepting of my identity, I'm happy to have a place where I can be truly myself. I'm also proud to be part of the group organizing Beersheba's Pride Parade this year. I chose to study at BGU because of the beautiful Negev, 
because of the amazing community atmosphere and students' life here, and also because of the excellent cognitive science program here. All these factors brought me to BGO, and now I know it was the right choice for me. The student association here is very active, and there are a lot of cultural events, especially politic weeks that opened my mind. I hope to study for my master's degree in brain science and investigate the connection between our nervous system and our behaviors. I hope to be a journalist so I can make information more accessible to everyone. We have a very special country with the option to become even better, but Israelis need to learn more about some of the problems we face, like poverty and violence, so they can take action to solve them. One day, everyone in Israel will be treated equally. My wish is that we all treat each other with understanding and respect. For Israel's 70th anniversary, I hope that we all continue to develop a wonderful country, and I really wish for peace. I feel like we should be doing more to make it happen, because it's the most important thing for our future and for our neighbors' future. We have a lot of things to be proud of, our science achievements, our culture, and our democracy. My wish is that we always continue to get better, to fight corruptions, close the deep social gaps that exist in Israel society, and have lives of peace that we are always praying for. Thank you, dear Adeline, Suzanne, and the amazing Zlotowski family for giving us the privilege of studying at BGU. We promise to continue the great Zlotowski tradition and make our own contribution to Israel in the years to come. Toda Thank you, Adia Michal. I would like to proceed to the second half of the program. This year, we are so pleased to host the world-renowned neurologist, psychologist, and researcher, laureate of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medi and Medicine, in 2014. Influential discoveries about the grid cells that constitute a special positioning system in the brain have provided instrumental insight into the ability of humans and animals to determine their location and navigate their environment. His research has far-reaching implications for understanding neurological diseases, including Alzheimer. Please welcome our exceptional guest lecturer for today, Professor Edward I. Moser. So thanks a lot for that kind uh, invitation and the introduction. Um, and um, I'm glad to see also the support that is for uh, science in general and especially also for neuroscience at this place and see that the Slotowski family uh, plays such a major role in this and uh, gives studentships, uh, fellowships to uh, young uh, engaged students like we heard. So uh, I'm glad that some of you want to go into neuroscience and investigate brain behavior relationship because that's just what I've been doing myself for, uh, for um, um, the last 30 years. So what I want to do today is to um, share with you uh, some of the developments that have taken place in, uh, in neuroscience or science of the brain during uh, the past uh, few decades. So um, when I was a young student, one of the things I really wanted to understand was just uh, as we heard, the relationship between brain and behavior. So how can we explain our most complex behaviors, such as uh, thinking, planning, remembering, uh, by neural activity? So at that time, in the 1980s, that sounded really uh, unachievable. But things have changed, and we are now in a position where, where we can start to understand very complex brain functions, some of them much better than others, but uh, those that we can understand better actually may serve as a guide to understanding the others. And um, perhaps uh, the one where we have come most far among higher brain functions in uh, mammals is our um, spatial mapping or positioning or navigation system. So in other words, the system that helps us tell where we are, 
and how we find our way. So those are very simple functions. So we all know where we are all the time, mo most of the time at least. So you know you're sitting here or there, and you know the way out if you need to go out. Uh, but uh, we don't really think about it because it's so obvious. But uh, let's step back a little bit and ask what it would it be like if you didn't have that ability. So this is something that evolved very early in evolution uh, because it is so central for survival. So I'll show you a movie that we made that illustrates this concept. How does life deal with space? It navigates. Life forms develop and change over time. Abilities and traits that prove useful for survival are retained across generations through the succession of species from the common ancestor to its progeny. These are the mechanisms of evolution. Natural selection has favored the species with the best ability to navigate. An organism that moves can escape from danger and find shelter. Navigation also allows us to actively find food. The safety of a flock or a suitable mate. Scientists have discovered a navigation system in the brain that is common for mammalian species as diverse as bats, rats, mice, monkeys and even humans. These discoveries suggest that this positioning system evolved from a common ancestor of mammals or earlier. We all share this system. So where is this system? Well, um, in the brain, obviously, but um, uh, there are some areas of the brain that uh, maybe are more important than others. So navigation or our ability to find our way involves a number of brain areas, of course, because it uh, in involves so many aspects. But uh, still, there are two brain areas that are particularly important um, and where a lot of research has been done. So that's the hippocampus. Um, the red brain structure that you see uh, on this drawing of a human brain and the entorhinal cortex which has more recently received attention which is closely interconnected with uh, the hippocampus. So those are both in the medial temporal lobe that's in behind your ears and uh, um, they, they are known to be important for these functions because patients who have damage to those brain areas have several deficits, um, one of which is uh, the uh, ability uh, or lack of ability to find their way. Uh, another one is also that this usually goes along with uh, uh, lack of memory. So those two are quite often connected, like in Alzheimer's disease. So, but how can we study them? One problem is that uh, the human brain is just, is, first of all, very complicated. And second, it is uh, very inaccessible. So it has uh, 100 billion neurons and uh, it has some uh, 100 to 1000 trillion connections between neurons, synaptic connections as we call them, where we believe that information is stored. So it's very, very hard to uh, get access to these very, very small structures that contain information when it's so uh, distributed and not really uh, easily available to either microscopy or electrophysiological recording or anything else. So what neuroscientists have uh, tried to do, like in, in most areas of biology, is to go to simpler systems. So the human brain, shown to the right here, contains, as I said, almost 100 billion neurons. Monkeys are smaller. But if you go to rodents, like rats or mice, you're down to only 200 million neurons or 70 million neurons, uh, respectively. And we could even go further than that, 
and uh, all the way down to uh, a nematode, a small worm, which is uh, one millimeter long, which uh, uh, has only 302 neurons. And then it's even then it's actually quite hard to understand what's going on because those 302 neurons can do quite a lot of things uh, uh, by themselves. But uh, still, simplicity um, makes uh, uh, a simple nervous system makes it easier to actually understand uh, the operations that take place. So um, usually uh, we have to stop somewhere in the middle because uh, many of the functions, brain functions that we want to understand, if we want to understand human behavior, they are at least uh, not shared with all organisms in the world. So uh, uh, and navigation is an example where it might make sense to stop with rats and mice because rats and mice are very good at finding their way and they use many of the same strategies as we humans use. So um, much of the work on navigation has been done in rodents and here we have uh, rodents uh, again and this slide illustrates the similarity of uh, mammalian brains in, in the right part here so we have a human brain up here, the human cortex. The cortex is the sheet that covers our brain, which uh, is important for um, most of our intellectual activity. And then a comparison with other primates, and then rodents here, you will see how similarly organized the cortex is. It consists of, of a similar number of layers of neurons, and each layer contains the same type of uh, types of neurons. They're connected in the same way and have many of the same properties. So uh, we could actually learn quite a lot by going to rodents when it comes to functions like navigation. So uh, in the history of uh, neuroscience and before that experimental psychology, the rat especially has played a, a major role. So uh, much of experimental psychology in rats was uh, in, in uh, the last hundred years was actually psychology of rats and uh, one key person when it comes to navigation is Edward Tolman who uh, was active uh, especially in the 1930s and 40s and 50s so what he proposed was that uh, uh, our knowledge is actually based on internal maps maps that we have in our brains and uh, that um, these maps he thought he could infer existed because he conducted experiments like the one shown here where that started at the bottom here went through a circle and then went through an alley and finally reached the goal and did that many 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 times and then on a given test day they started here again came to the circle but now there were many alleys or arms out from uh, the test, uh, from the circle, uh, and one of them brought the rat directly to the food, the, which is indicated with a P here. And what happened was that the rats uh, actually took the direct path to the food. That's not very surprising because that's what we would do too if we really wanted to have that food. Uh, but uh, it was not obvious because at that time, um, psychologists thought that behaviors were sequences, long sequences of stimuli and responses that were sort of chained together based on what the rat had done before. So there was no prediction from these uh, theories that the rat could do anything it had not done before. So that um, this was quite uh, a revolutionary, had revolutionary consequences and uh, made Tolman very unpopular for many, many years because just he, he broke with traditional psychology, suggested that there is some sort of internal map in the brain, but uh, there was no hard evidence for it. He couldn't really go into the brain uh, because psychologists at that time uh, tried to avoid the brain. They treated it as a black box and then uh, took the inputs that came into the brain and the outputs and try to describe relationships between them without considering what actually uh, goes on in the brain. And that made sense at that time because uh, uh, there was uh, a lack of knowledge about the brain and uh, no tools really for studying it. 
So, but then things changed, and in the 1950s, a number of developments uh, happened, and also people got more optimistic about the future again. And uh, then uh, one of the things that happened was the development uh, by uh, David Hubel of the uh, tungsten microelectrode. So uh, these electrodes, as you see here, are very, very sharp um, electrodes. They're very thin at the end, just a few uh, micrometers. And then um, they are able to pick up electrical signals from the near vicinity. So if uh, you insert these into the brain, they can pick up signals from individual cells. And you can then listen to the dis electrical discharges. And uh, then uh, this is even possible to do, as Jubel showed uh, later with Thorsten Wiesel, and for which he got Nobel Prize in the visual system. He, he showed that uh, it actually is possible to do this in, in uh, awake or semi-awake animals, and that you can show that, for example, if you flash a certain visual uh, stimulus, uh, then you can see a response in the visual part of the brain. Um, cells that specifically respond to one uh, property or another. So uh, this also inspired other people and one of them was John O'Keefe who in uh, 1970 uh, started to record from rats that walked in boxes like the one shown here or in mazes and walked around and then had uh, these electrodes inserted in the brain. Um, as I said very very thin wires that are so thin they go between the cells and pick up electrical activity um, and then um, for the during the recording they are connected with a cable to a computer or an oscilloscope and uh, he could then watch the uh, electrical signals or the action potentials as we call them from these cells. And this was uh, in the hippocampus the red structure I showed you so in the rodent brain it looks like this uh, sausage or cashew nut shaped structure here. So what did he see? So this um, was uh, the basis for uh, O'Keefe's discovery of place cells in 1971. So what I'm going to show you now to illustrate the concept of a place cell is uh, I'll show you another movie and um, you will be uh, seeing a rat that walks around. This is seen from the top. Uh, the rat uh, chases chocolate pieces, small pieces of chocolate. They really like chocolate, uh, and that motivates them to run around, visit every possible place in the box. And uh, at the same time, we will uh, listen to the electrical activity of one single cell in the hippocampus. So each time the cell is electrically active, you will hear a pop sound, and uh, and you will see a red dot appearing on uh, the screen where the rat is at just that time. Okay, so let's start the movie. So, I think you get the point. Um, you see this particular cell is electrically active only when the rat is in the upper left part of the box and uh, at other times the cell is totally silent. And because it's active only in one place, O'Keefe then called it a place cell. And uh, another way to show uh, such a cell is to use a heat map. So then uh, same box seen from above, red means high activity and blue means low activity. So there turned out to be many cells like this. Most of the cells in the hippocampus actually were like this, but they were active in different places of the box. And uh, together, it turned out that they kind of formed a map of the whole environment. And for that reason, then O'Keefe and his colleague Lynn Nedell suggested in 1978 that hippocampus is perhaps uh, the basis of uh, the map that Tolman had proposed some uh, 20, 30 years before, but had no access to the brain to actually determine whether it existed. So uh, um, that was a major breakthrough, and for that uh, O'Keefe then also got the Nobel Prize, 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 Nobel Prize for, 
for uh, finding uh, um, the positioning system uh, in mammals. So then many years passed. Um, and now I'll jump to 1996 uh, and now I'll slide into um, our own work. And uh, our own work has a starting point, uh, has a starting point uh, of um, how does this place cell signal arise? Because um, this is not in the sensory part of the brain or the sensory parts of the cortex. It's really in the middle of the cortex, very far from any sensory inputs so and very far from the motor system. So this is, uh, uh, this is not something that comes from receptors from, uh, on the fingers or in the ears or in the eyes. It's something that the brain itself actually constructs in some way. So how can the brain construct such a precise signal of where the brain is? Because if you feed these place cell signals, to computer, then they can tell second by second exactly where the animal is based on the combined activity of which cells are active. So how are these signals created? So what we did at that time, we asked where is it, uh, where is this generated first of all and how is it generated? So this is a transaction through the hippocampus. Hippocampus has this sausage-like uh, structure and if you slice through it, it looks like this. And essentially what this diagram shows is that the connectivity through the hippocampus is a one-way circuit. So it begins at the bottom and then goes in from the entorhinal cortex, the blue part of the human brain I showed in the beginning, then goes through se several areas and then comes out at C1, uh, where most of the recordings had been done before and place cells had been studied. And then it goes back to the entorhinal cortex. And at that time in the 1990s, it was commonly believed that uh, this loop uh, contained much of the machinery that created the play cell signal. So um, what we did then was to inactivate or take away parts of this loop and then ask if you take it away, then it should disappear. You shouldn't have any play cell activity any longer in uh, the remaining part of hippocampus. That actually turned out not to be true. So we found that even if you took away part of that circuit and really blocked the traffic through it, there were still play cells, as you can see in those seven examples down here. So seven different cells, each are firing in, in discrete places still. So that led us then to ask maybe we should look more closely outside the hippocampus, uh, not in the red area, but in the blue area, in the entorhinal cortex. Okay, so we then started recording in the entorhinal cortex instead. So this is now in the blue area of the human brain. So this is uh, to the right, you see a rat brain, and uh, the colored area here is the entorhinal cortex in the rat. So we put electrodes in the entorhinal cortex um, at those places which we knew were connected with uh, the areas of the hippocampus where place cells uh, were present. So what happened then? Well, then we found the following. So what you see here is, uh, if you begin to the right, then you see a diagram uh, of the box again. Now the box is much bigger, it's more than two meters each way. The grey trace is where the rat walked over a period of 30 minutes. And then you can see it visits uh, almost every place in the box. And then on top you have black dots illustrating like on the movie where uh, the rat was when the cell was active. So what you can see is that now this cell is not only active at one place like the place cells in the campus, but active at many places. And furthermore, those places actually form a pattern, so as you can see in the other image here, I've tried to put these red lines on top just to illustrate the pattern. So it's actually a triangular or a hexagonal pattern that repeats itself all over the entire environment. So because this forms a grid structure, a kind of grid map, uh, we call them grid cells, and uh, it was clear then from this uh, what we observed that these cells contain information 
not only about position, but also about distances and directions. So uh, that was the discovery of grid cells in 2005. So um, then we found grid cells came in a number of varieties. They could differ in phase. So phase is different XY locations. So shown here for two different grid cells, one green and one blue. You can see they shifted in XY uh, space. Or they could have different scales. So one grid cell is small, the green one, and the other has a larger spacing, uh, the blue one. Or they could shift uh, different orientation. They could be tilted relative to each other. So all of these variations existed among the probably many 10,000 of grid cells that existed in the rat brain. So how was this organized? Well, when it comes to the grid phase, it turned out that grid phases are all present locally everywhere. So uh, this is illustrated here by showing the four the electrodes. So these electrodes each are only 17 micrometers uh, wide. But we usually use four in order to be able to differentiate nearby uh, cells because cells from one cell will have slightly different shapes and amplitudes on each of, of uh, the electrodes. So that's a technical detail, but that's the reason why I show uh, four. So underneath here, under the electrodes, you see uh, four, uh, three different cells, one in blue, one in red, and one in green. And then you see the grid patterns of each of them. Um, you can see they're all grid cells, but they have different XY locations or different phases. So that suggests that in every local cluster, you have all possible locations uh, represented. So it's kind of uh, often what we call, uh, often what we call uh, uh, is, is uh, salt and pepper organizations, totally randomly mixed. So uh, that is for the phase, but when it comes to the scale, it's actually quite well organized. So um, if one begins at the top, so this is uh, what you see here is uh, a rat brain seen from the side. And the red area is the entorhinal cortex, medial entorhinal cortex. If you begin from the top, you have the grid cells with the smaller scale. And as you go further down, then you get bigger and bigger scales. And uh, the larger scales was, it's a bit hard to, to determine because you don't really have large enough boxes for the rats to run in. But the largest one we now had just a few days ago was actually almost three meters in the distance between each of the fields. So um, it's a very wide range from about 30 centimeter interfield dif dif distances up here and to uh, several meters down here. So is then this a continuous scale going from small scale to large scale? Or is this actually um, a composition of multiple maps, but a finite, finite number of maps? So it turns to be the latter, because uh, it's a, what you see here is uh, a recording from one single animal. So um, on the <coughs> x-axis you have uh, the position uh, in anatomical space. This is top, the top here, and uh, to the right you have the bottom uh, down here, and then uh, well it's actually in the middle. And then as you go deeper and deeper, this is from left to right, and you can see that the size of the grid or the distance between the peaks increases. Yes, we knew that. But you can also see when you know that each dot is one, one cell, uh, that actually it's a stepwise increase. So the further down you get, uh, the higher uh, spacing you get, but it is a stepwise increase. So there are actually four steps in this case. Um, and those steps, they, uh, we often refer to these uh, uh, individual maps as modules, so call it module 1, module 2, module 3, and module 4, M1 to M4. And then we asked, is there any particular relationship between those uh, uh, modules? And it turns out to be that, because if you divide M2 by M1, or M3 by M2, or M4 by M3, we get the same number. It's about 1.4. So that this is a constant scale factor that brings you from one level to the next. So it's like in a geometric progression. But this is uh, an interesting way of organizing space, which uh, uh, may have some advantages, uh, give a more precise localization. 
which we can talk about later, but uh, um, this, this seems to be a pretty strong aspect of how grid cells are organized. So you may then wonder, are grid cells and play cells, are they just for rats and mice? So based on the movie I showed initially, I would say probably no. But there has been research since then that actually shown that uh, it, most likely they exist in all mammals. And uh, um, one example, the first example outside the rodent world. So what you see here is a phylogenetic tree for mammals. Um, is that you see rodents, uh, rats and mice are on this branch here. But uh, um, then uh, there were recordings in bats actually from the Weizmann Institute, from uh, uh, Nahum Ulanovsky's group. So they recorded Egyptian fruit bats, which are on a completely different branch of the uh, phylogenetic tree. And still they have these uh, grid cells with just the same properties. So later, grid cell-like cells were found in, uh, in monkeys and even in humans. So in humans, uh, they're not easy to record. But there are a few humans who have serious uh, uh, degrees of epilepsy and then one has to implant <coughs> electrodes in order to monitor and find out where the epilepsy st starts. And then you get signals from those cells for free and uh, they could actually then determine that most likely some of these cells were grid cells. So uh, most likely then I would say that is, this is a common system for mammals. So now, um, let's see, still 10 minutes, right? Or, yeah. So uh, uh, just to say that uh, grid cells were the first that we found in this system, but there are many others. So first of all, there was another type of cell that signals direction that was discovered in a different brain area already in uh, 1985 by Jim Rank. So these cells do not really indicate any particular location. They just scattered throughout, but this shows firing rate as a function of the direction of the head. And you can see this cell, for example, only fires when the rat is walking in the leftward direction. This one only when it's walking in the leftward and up direction from bottom right to top left. So these are direction cells like the compass, and they are active anywhere in the box. It's just when the rat is walking in a certain <coughs> direction. Then there is another type of cell that we call border cells. They are active, uh, th as the heat map shows, only when the rat is at a certain border of the environment. So this is again the box seen from above. And in this case, only along the east side of the box. And that's independently of the shape of the box. <coughs> and this shows when you move the rat to a different box, a different room. Then it actually is active on the left side. If you then insert the wall, it follows that wall as well. So these are cells that are completely different from grid cells, uh, they are, but they are only follow all kinds of borders. It can be walls of a box, or it can be uh, edge of a table, or anything that marks a boundary for where the rat can walk. Um, so they coexist with grid cells. And then there's yet another type, they're called speed cells, uh, that follow the exact speed of the animal. So let's just focus on the upper left part here. So this shows a recording over two minutes. And then uh, in gray in the background, you see the speed of the rat. Uh, maybe if you focus on the yellow one, you see in back in, in gray uh, speed. And then in yellow, you see the activity of a particular cell. And you can see how closely that activity actually follows the speed. So that these cells, they actually like a speedometer. They read out the speed of the rat as it's running around. And that's very useful information that you need to have together with direction if you want to update your map all the time based on actually where the animal is moving. So update it second by second or even actually at shorter intervals. And finally, there's a new type of cell that uh, we just discovered that um, is active when uh, rats are at a certain location relative to an object in the environment. So this is an object, it's a cylinder made out of uh, uh, Lego bricks. And you can see that these cells typically fire at a per certain distance and direction away from that object. And uh, they do so uh, um, 
they do so in uh, very very reliably independently of the actual nature of the object so it uses expresses a kind of vector calculation relative to the position of the object which is another way of calculating position so I'll talk more about that in the next talk uh, afterwards and then uh, finally I want to say a few words about time coding which I will also talk more about uh, in the next talk and this is uh, because we have now learned a lot about space but we are really ignorant about time uh, so we have investigated that too and it shows just a typical recording in a box um, 12 different boxes in a sequence and then uh, this shows cells that actually express activity that follows the time that passes in the different boxes so some cells follow time that has passed in each box so black here is in one black box then white is in the next white box and so on you can see that this cell increases activity as a function of time in each of the trials in the boxes and this shows one that a cell that just has activity decreasing over time and this shows a, a cell that is active only in uh, the black version of uh, the boxes but with decreasing activity and so on so we use then various uh, analysis uh, general linear model analysis to determine the fractional cells that are responsive to a number of factors like the color of the box the position of the animal or at time and it turned out that in an area next to where we find the spatial cells called the lateral entorhinal cortex there's a quite large number of cells that respond to uh, time and that's not present in any area else where position is much stronger so there is an area where time uh, of uh, an event actually is represented quite strongly and uh, I will again say more about that in the next part so just then for conclusion I want to uh, just put this in some perspective so first of all say that the work we are doing that is basic research and we think it is un essential to understand how the normal brain works if you ever uh, want to cure any diseases but now it so happens that uh, Alzheimer's disease quite often uh, starts exactly in the same brain area that contains the uh, grid cells and the time code and, and all that so uh, that's the entorhinal cortex the blue area that you saw and uh, there are studies then showing that uh, before Alzheimer starts then if you compare those that later get Alzheimer we call converters and those that do not get uh, Alzheimer then the brain volume already shrinks is shrinked uh, years before they actually get Alzheimer's in that particular brain area and uh, as you all know Alzheimer's disease increases with age and the population and life expectancy increases significantly so that just uh, reminds us all that it is, is and will become an increasing problem so there are many reasons for trying to solve that and because it is the same area of the brain that actually contains these cells that we're studying there is likely a link and that could be also one place to start so with that I want to uh, just finish uh, say there are many people who have been involved they are all listed here and many people have paid for the work so uh, I will just then thank you for the attention and then uh, um, for those who are neuroscientists I want to know more I think I'm supposed to continue somewhere else soon okay. so I would like to conclude the annual Zotowski event by thanking everyone here for being with us today and by expressing my gratitude for today's guest, guest lecture for sharing his thought with us all. Enjoy the rest of your day.